Let's begin reading together at verse 31. I'll read to verse uh, 35, and we'll begin our study. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 31, reading to verse 35. Jesus says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You've sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. And so as we've been going through chapter 5, let me remind you how that in previous verses, Jesus had made a statement. He has actually claimed equality with God. And when he was claiming equality with God, when he said, my father works up to now and I work, and they recognized that, those who were listening to him recognized that he was claiming equality. When Jesus was claiming equality, he was saying that he was equal to God in nature, power, and authority. Uh, when he said, I'm equal to him in nature, in verse 18, he had said that, that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Uh, when he was saying he was equal in power, in verse 19, he said, whatever God does, the Son also does, in like manner. And then when he spoke of authority, he did so in verse 22, when he said, God has committed all judgment to the Son. And so Jesus Christ has claimed equality with God in nature, power, and authority. In verse 23, he had declared that for a person to truly honor God, they must also honor him. And I mentioned this to you, but as way of introduction, the Bible teaches that worship of anything other than God himself in Scripture is very clearly declared to be idolatry. And remember how in the book of Exodus, when the Lord was giving his commands, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, he had said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And he went on to say, you shall have no other gods before me. And so Jesus declared himself as being equal to God and even was saying that they must honor him. He instructed his hearers that if they were really honoring God, they would honor him. Now you can imagine what they were thinking when Jesus was saying this to them. I mean, what if some man, what if I came up and said, you know, you need to honor me even as you honor, honor God? Well, I guess I'd be here by myself within five minutes because you would recognize immediately that that's blasphemy, that that's wrong. That's absolutely not true. There's only one God you worship. And yet that's how they're responding to what Jesus is saying. That is what's provoking them. They're thinking this man blasphemes. And so even... I guess to add the cherry to the top of, of it all, he made it clear that he was the one who has the ability to grant people eternal life. Uh, let's read verse 24 again, just to remind you of that. He had said in chapter 5, verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment and has passed from death into life. To believe him, to believe his message, is to have everlasting life. And so he's speaking to religious people. And he's speaking to those who already believe themselves to be spiritually alive. Yet he's making it clear that they need to hear his word and believe in God in order to be saved. And in the entire history of the nation of Israel, no other king, no other leader, prophet, or teacher has ever claimed that kind of authority. So immediately, those listening would question inside how can he say such things? They would say that he's promoting himself. That's what they were later to say in John 8, 13. The Pharisees said, you bear witness of yourself. Your, your witness isn't true. They'd be thinking he's promoting himself. But Jesus anticipates this. And that's why he says in verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So he anticipates that. He anticipates that suggestion that he's promoting himself, and that's why he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness isn't true. You see, Jewish law required independent confirmation of at least two or three witnesses. 
You could never make an accusation with capital, of a capital offense without two witnesses or three. Now, according to Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. That saved them against false accusations. There needed to be more than one person making that statement. And so Jesus is making it very clear that he is not a bearing witness of himself. And now he's going to give various witnesses that are going to speak on his behalf, if you will. And so he's presenting four witnesses that establish his claims. In verse 32 and 33, he says, There's another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. And then he goes on in verse 33 to name this witness. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. So first he says, you've sent to John. You saw something unusual in John. You even questioned him concerning his ministry. Remember back in chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, they had spoken and had asked John, Who are you? They asked, Are you Elijah the prophet? So you sent to John. You saw something unusual in him. You questioned him concerning his ministry. And so you're very aware of the things that he is doing, the things that he was saying. Yet, verse 34 says, Yet I don't receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. In other words, I'm not relying on his testimony or man's testimony. I'm only stating this so you might be saved. Now remember John. Remember his ministry. John was the forerunner of Messiah. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. In John chapter 1, verse 7, we had read, This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. And so... He's speaking concerning him, that voice crying in the wilderness. He's saying that John came to reveal Jesus to the people. It was John who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is the one who presented Jesus Christ as a witness. John presented Jesus as the Savior. And so by referring to John, Jesus is confirming his mission as well as his message. But John's message and mission isn't the greatest witness. It's one of the witnesses. You see, this is the reason Jesus refers to John. He wanted people to be saved. That's the whole point of his ministry. Again, verse 34, I say these things that you may be saved. That's why I'm referring to John. That's why I'm speaking to you. We've already seen in John 3 how that God has said that he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's the whole point of Christ coming. And so Jesus said, John was bearing testimony, but the whole purpose of all of this is so that you might be saved. Jesus came to save. Now, that's a word that we Christians use. We used to use it an awful lot more in the early days of my walk with the Lord. That was a very common word. We would use the word saved. Are you saved? Today, there seems to be different ways of describing the salvation experience. But at that time, we would ask that question, are you saved? Jesus came to save. In the New Testament, the word saved is used around 53 times. And the word in the New Testament is, is the Greek word sozo, and, and, it, and it means to be delivered. It means to be healed, made complete. It speaks of being rescued or even being made Paul. Jesus came so that people would be rescued, that they'd be delivered, that they'd be made complete, that they would be made whole. He didn't want any to perish, but all to have everlasting life. That's what Isaiah 45, 22 says, look unto me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I'm God, there is no other. You need to look to me to be saved. That's the heart of Jesus' message and ministry. That's what he's doing. He's saying these things that you, he said, may be saved, that you might be rescued, that you may be made complete, that you would be made whole so that you might be delivered. Well, wait a minute. Somebody says, what do I need to be saved from? Why should I be rescued? What's wrong with me? Well, one, before we come to Christ, the Bible describes us as, as being in the wilderness of sin. The Bible speaks of us as being in bondage. We're like sheep that have gone astray. 
And we have a, a shepherd that is seeking after us. In, in Luke 15, verse 4, Jesus said, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? So we're out there wandering in the wilderness. We're dry, thirsty, broken, messed up. We're lost. And so Jesus is here in order that we might be made whole, maybe saved, maybe delivered, maybe rescued. We're in sin. And in sin, we're spiritually lost. But Jesus in Matthew 18, 11 said, The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. In 1 Timothy 1, 15, Paul said, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Isaiah 53, verse 6 tells us, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we have to be rescued. We're in the wilderness of Wilderness of sin, we're in bondage, we're spiritually lost. But one day, we're going to be judged. It's appointed, according to Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed to men to die once. After this, the judgment. Somebody says, I, I've, I've heard people say, no, I believe in reincarnation. No, you don't. You don't want to. I mean, who wants to come back as a snail? Come on. <laughs> now, the Bible... <laughs> The Bible doesn't give us second opportunities. Mark that in your heart and understand that. You have one life to live, one opportunity of a lifetime, and within that lifetime you can make that choice. But it's appointed unto men to die once, and after this judgment, we all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You remember when Paul and Silas were in a Philippian jail. It's recorded in Acts 16. And, and they had been taken. They had been put in stocks. And at midnight, the scripture says, they were singing praises to God. And the people in the jails were listening. The Philippian jailer who was there came and spoke to them. And as he was speaking to them, he asked the question, Sirs, how can I be saved? And the response was quick. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. What do you mean, and your household? Does that include everybody? When I got saved, did everybody automatically get saved? No, because when you look further on in the passage, it speaks how Paul had an opportunity to share with his whole family the same message the Philippian heard. But how do I get saved? Well, I was lost. My shepherd found me, called me by name. I turned to him. I said to him, God, forgive me a sinner. And he did. I've been rescued, and my spiritual brokenness, that heart that was so torn and so messed up, so filled with anger and evil, he, well, he took the heart of stone, and he replaced it with a, a living heart, a heart of flesh. And he wrote on my heart, on the tablet of my heart, his word. And he made my body his temple. And he took my name, and he put it in a book of life. And now I belong to him. And the reason I belong to him is because he sought me out. It wasn't me seeking him. It was the shepherd calling his sheep by name out of that wilderness. And he said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ does. And so why did he come? He tells us. He says, I came in order that you, you might be saved. These things I'm saying are in order that you might be saved. My words are life. Speaking of John in verse 35, he says he was a burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Now a lamp, when he says he was a burning and shining lamp, a lamp has three qualities that reveal his dependence on Jesus. When you look at a lamp, one, a lamp doesn't light itself. So Jesus is the one who ignited John. Uh, a, la a lamp guides people in the darkness. And the Bible tells us John was a voice crying in the wilderness. And a lamp needs oil. And John was filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus refers to him as a lamp, a burning and shining lamp. And you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. One of the things I found interesting about that and it's true today, too, by the way. We know this to be so. 
People can appreciate a prophetic voice like John's without responding to the message. There are people who are not believers who when you're speaking to them and sharing Christian things with them, they'll agree with you. They'll say, you're right, we need this. You're right, we need that. You say, I think it's better that a husband and a wife uh, um, remain married for a lifetime. And many people will agree with you. They'll say, yeah, I think that's true too. It's better for society. I think it's good that a man and a woman, when they have children, they ought to be married first. And they'll say, yeah, I can see that. It makes sense to me. They can agree with you. They might even agree about some things about the Lord. They might even say, well, if, if there ever was a, a, a Messiah, it certainly could be Jesus Christ. They might like the things that you say. And sometimes they listen in. When you're having a conversation, you'll be surprised. And they appreciate what you're saying. If you're speaking to somebody on the job or whatever and you have opportunity and you're sharing, they may appreciate it. And sometimes they even come to church. They'll come on a Sunday. Maybe they come on an Easter. Maybe they come on a Christmas. Maybe they'll come in a, you know, sometime and they hear it and they might even appreciate it. And some of you have invited friends and, and sometimes they'll walk away and say, yeah, a lot of that I agree with you. They would say that if you have an honest conversation. But it makes me think of Ezekiel. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 30 through 33, listen to this. God is speaking to the prophet, and he says, As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you besides the walls and the doors of the houses. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come to pass then they will know that a prophet has been among them. There are people who appreciate. He says, Ezekiel, you'll give that message, your prophetic word, and the people are speaking about you out, out in the town, around the wall, talking around the dinner table. Man, did you hear what Ezekiel had to say? He said, they appreciate it. They say, this guy's amazing. He's like someone who sings well and plays the guitar skillfully. He says, they'll come and they'll sit before you. And they do so as my people. They're, in other words, they're, they're, they're assuming the posture of a believer. We can say, well, they go to church. They sit there to listen to the study. They sit before you as my people. He says, but they're not my people. Why? Why are you saying they're not my people? Because they hear and they do not do. That's the difference. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say, Jesus says. Why? If you love me, he said, keep my commandments. See, the way to demonstrate that we really love him is to do what he says, to keep his word. To sit and appreciate it, that's one thing. To apply it, that's something else. And so Jesus is speaking about John, and he says they appreciated him. Because he would speak to the powers that be. He spoke to the, to the Roman soldiers. And, and he spoke to the, to the Pharisees. And he confronted them. And the common people appreciated what, what he had to say. Many of them, he said, they, they rejoiced. You rejoiced in his light for a little while. He was a lamp. And you rejoiced in his light for a little while. You were willing to do that. He was a good witness. And you heard his witness. He says, I have a witness. The witness was John. Then he has a second witness in verse 36. I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now when he says uh, the works, the works uh, are his general works including miracles. So the things that were associated with what Messiah would do. Um, in, in John chapter 3, verse 2, do you remember that conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus? you remember how Nicodemus came to the Lord by night? 
And, and he began to speak to him. It's recorded in John 3, verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So he says, I have a greater witness than simply the testimony of John. He says, the works that I'm performing, the works that Messiah does, the miracles are, are undeniable. When you read your Bible and you begin to look at the miracles that are recorded in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, the Gospels record no less than 34 miracles. And Jesus in John chapter 10, let's see, we're in chapter 5 now in about two years. We'll get here. In John chapter 10, Jesus said in verse 25, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. In chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, Jesus said, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. We're going to see that his, his um, detractors and opponents, um, his enemies didn't deny that he performed works, but they gave his works... Um, the definition that they were done in a satanic way. In Luke 11, verse 15, some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They didn't deny his works. They simply attributed his works to Satan. So Jesus said, but these works are intended to draw you. These works are not being done in order for you to be entertained. These works that I'm doing are intended to draw your attention so that you'll know there's one greater in your midst, and that the works that are being performed are actually signs that would draw your attention to come to faith in God. The way that Nicodemus saw the signs, spoke amongst his friends, and came and interviewed Christ. And later on, we know Nicodemus became a follower of Christ. So I have the witness of John. I also have my works. Then he has a third witness, verse 37 and 38. The Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, you do not believe. And so he has a third witness, the Father. Now, the testimony of the Father was already alluded to in verse 32 when he said, there's another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. That's an allusion to his father. So he's already spoken concerning his father. But we see this witness also at his baptism. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, Boo! No, saying, <laughs> This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. They could hear the voice. Imagine that for a moment. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus is on his way to his betrayal and death. His hour has finally arrived. He speaks concerning it. In John 12, 27 and 28, he says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And John writes, Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You have the witness of my Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But he says in verse 37, you've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. When he says you've neither heard his voice or seen his form, that's another way of saying you have no real knowledge of him and you have no fellowship with him. You see, even when your prophet spoke to you, you refused to hear them. You refused to obey. In Luke 11, verses 47 through 51, he said, woe to you. For you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers. For they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them 
they will kill and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor have you seen his form. You have no knowledge of him, and you, know you have no fellowship with him. Someone said this has been the uniform characteristic of the nation. Their ancestors disregarded the testimony of God, and their generation was also guilty of disregarding him. He says in verse 38, But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. The Old Testament prophesied the coming of Messiah. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. And though he gave them evidence, they still not, did not value the word of God. There he is right before them, fulfilling the things that were written concerning Messiah. And they are still rejecting. And so he gives a fourth witness, the Bible, God's word. In verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. As we've seen, the Father has been a witness to the Son in various ways. Jesus already said that the Father loves the Son. The Father committed all judgment to the Son. The Father granted the Son to have life in himself. The Father gave him authority. The Father sent him. But the question is, how does the Father most clearly bear witness? And he does it through the belief in and reception of the message Christ brought. You're not saved, guys. You're not saved. You know this, but I'll say it quickly. By your feelings. Your feelings can lie to you. Feelings do that, you know. Feelings lie. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. It lies. Sometimes your feelings, if you rest your eternal life on them, sometimes your feelings will betray you. Because sometimes you may not feel saved. I know that when I first became a Christian, I know that maybe two weeks into my walk with the Lord, I woke up one morning and I didn't have that amazing joy that I had had for the last two weeks. You know, because when I got saved, it was like a, a giant boulder of sin rolled off my shoulders. I felt peace and, and, and love and, and, and joy, something I had never had had before. But two weeks or so within, with, within the first two weeks of my walk with the Lord, I began to wonder and doubt and I didn't feel saved, and I came to discover very early that I'm not saved by feelings, I'm saved by faith. And that it, it's by grace that I'm saved through faith, not, not of myself. It's a gift of God, and not by works lest anyone should boast. I had to come to know that, because my heart is deceitful, and, and it can cause me to wonder sometimes whether or not I really did commit myself to the Lord. And so the Father most clearly is going to to strengthen us in terms of witnesses by his message. Uh, it's by receiving and doing, and that gives to you the peace of knowing that, that God has actually fulfilled his word to you. In John 7, 16 and 17, uh, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine isn't mine, but his who sent me. He said, If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Just put it into practice and see if it doesn't bear fruit. You see, one of the things that I'm concerned with in, in our time, in the church's lifetime, is in this generation right now, is we're starting to trust our feelings much more than, than God's word. Um, we're, if, if somebody says something that makes me feel good, then it must be true. And unfortunately, there are a lot of things being said that are not true. I'll give you an example. I won't name the guy because I don't remember his name, but I happened to see him yesterday. He was on TV, and I saw him for a minute. He refers to himself as a prophet, and that, that to me, I, that's, that's interesting enough. I want to see what this prophet has to say. 
So I put him on, and he turned out to be a nonprofit. As I was listening, <laughs> as I was listening, my wife and I, 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 I could only listen less than five minutes. I turned to Marie and I said, this is amazing. This guy's on television preaching a message that is so absolutely false. And I just shook my head. He was, he was saying, I'll give you one example, that the voice in the garden that Adam and Eve, the, the voice of the Lord in the garden, is referred to as the Lord was walking in the garden. He said that that was Elijah, the prophet, walking in the garden. Yeah. And I'm looking at him. You know, that's what you do when you watch TV. I was looking at him. <laughs> and I was shaking my head. And then he went on and said several things that were just so outlandish. And I turned to my wife and I said, man, I said, there are, uh, there are a lot of people listening to this guy right now. And he's, and he's advertising himself as prophet so-and-so. And he looks with certainty into the camera and, and raises that prophetic finger and points. And I'm going, my, my, my. Listen, there are people listening to him. There are people believing people like that because they want to. Because their feelings their heart wants to accept the things that he's saying. And that's how false prophets very often work. And in today's church, and I'll say this quickly because I don't want to condemn my own family, but in today's church, we, we really have to get back to loving God's word. We have to come back to reading it. We have to come back to spending time meditating on it and taking our notes and, and seeking God so that we're not deceived. Remember I've told you out of Scripture, Matthew 24, when Jesus is asked by his disciples, what is the sign of your coming? And, and it's singular. What is the sign of your coming? Singular. And though Jesus speaks about earthquakes, and you know that with our recent earthquakes that we've had here, that, that uh, a lot of prophets were shouting out, earthquake, you know, because... Because it's in Matthew 24, and, 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 and let's be prophetic in this and that. But the, but the sign that Jesus said, because it was a question singular, what is the sign before you come? And what is it, you guys remember, what is it? False teachers. False teachers. Four times in Matthew 24, Jesus warns about false teachers. So the sign of the last days is not simply the earthquakes and the pestilence and the various other things that he speaks of. The sign of the last days is false doctrine, bad teaching. And his people that he came to speak to were aware of traditions and rabbinic teachings. But God's word had incarnated in front of them and they were rejecting Jesus the Messiah himself. And so he's speaking concerning that when he says in verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify, he says, of me. You ransack the Bible. The word search means to ransack. You thoroughly investigate it, but you're coming up short because in your investigation, you have failed to see me. Your traditions are keeping you from understanding that scripture is revealing me. This is the witness. He says in verse 40, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. You see, they thought they were God's children because they were familiar with the Bible. The problem was they, they read the word, but in unbelief, they didn't allow it to penetrate their heart. Their problem was not intellectual. Their problem was moral. It was spiritual. Notice he says, you're unwilling to come to faith in me. It's an action of your wills. I was speaking to a friend of mine when I was in the military. His name was Rich. We called him Big Rich because he was big. <laughs> and he told us to. So Big Rich. He was my roommate. He was also my, my best friend in the Army. And Rich came from Delano. And so he and I roomed together and... 
and I would share with him. I was a, a new Christian. I was a brand new Christian. But I would share with him about the Lord, the little that I knew I would give to him. I can still remember I would be reading scripture and he'd come into, the, uh, into our room and, and I'd say, Rich, I want to read this to you. And I would read, I always found a passage that would be about getting saved. And uh, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Rich, look at that. This is what he said. And I would do that to him all the time. I still remember one day he came walking in and I said, Rich, I want to tell you something. He says, no, wait a minute. And then he goes, shutteth, this is what he says to me, shutteth thy moutheth. He goes, <laughs> book of Big Rich, chapter 5, verse 1. I'll never forget that. But I would share with him, and I loved him. He was my friend. And, and it, you love someone, you tell them the truth, right? You love someone, you tell them about the Lord. And one day he and I were conversing, Rich, why don't you give your heart to Christ? And this is his answer. He said to me, because if I come to faith in the Christ you proclaim, David, then I'm telling my mother she's a liar because of the way she raised me. He says, I cannot go back on what my mom has taught me. And I thought, what an un unusual thing until a few years later, I was talking to somebody else, and I asked the same question, why haven't you given your heart to Christ? And he says, because of the way my mother taught me, and I don't want to dishonor my mom. And I said this to him, I'll never forget. I said, are you willing to go ha to hell for your mother? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, I wasn't. I wasn't willing to go to hell for my mother but I was willing to bring my mother to heaven. You need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's how it works. And, and Jesus is making it very clear. You are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Your problem is spiritual. It's not simply intellectual. You know things. You're unwilling to come because it's an action of your will. You're refusing to believe. You're refusing to believe what you've read your entire lifetime. A lot of people go to church their whole life and never come to faith in Christ. I remember a young woman who approached me after a church service years ago now. She walks up to me after a church service when we were in Ontario at the Ontario High School. And she approached me after the service because she had come forward to give her heart to Christ. And as she, she wanted to talk to me. And I remember her saying, my father is a pastor in the city here in Ontario. My father's a pastor. If I mentioned his name, she said... You'd know who he is. She was a woman. She wasn't a little girl. She was a woman. She says, I've been going to church my whole life. She said, I decided to come and visit today. She said, and for the first time in my life, I realized I never have committed my heart to Jesus Christ. I never have. I was talking to Holland Davis, who's a, one of my dear friends and a wonderful worship leader and pastor of a church in San Clemente. And I was, we were talking about how the Lord can speak to you in ways that sometimes can, can be kind of, well, I'll say it like this. I said, Holland, I said, this is years ago, again, in Ontario High School. I said, I gave an invitation, and one of the worship leaders who was playing lead guitar in our worship team came off the stage and came and received the Lord. And I'm looking at him thinking, <laughs> how'd you make it on a worship team? You don't even know Jesus Christ. Because he, and that's, this is true for many people, he was convinced he knew Christ because of ritual and tradition. I must be a Christian. I'm not a Muslim. I must be a Christian. I'm not a Buddhist. I must be a Christian because I go to church. America, it's been said that in the United States, more people went to hell in the 50s than in any other time in history. That's true or not true? I don't know. But what an interesting statement. Why is that? Because in the 50s, almost everybody went to church. You know, here in California, um, it's not like uh, it was in the 50s. You know, I grew up, obviously, in the 50s, and I can tell you that um, Sundays, church, church, uh, churches had people in it, and stores were closed. There were no stores open on, on, on Sundays. Now, that's true in the South to this day. You can go to certain cities in the South, and, and it's closed on Sunday. But in California, in Norwalk, where I grew up, no markets were open. 
Stores are closed. Everything's shut down. There used to be these Norman Rockwell pictures of families around the table having pot roast. That was true. Even my Mexican family had pot roast on Sunday. <laughs> it's true with tortillas, but we had it. <laughs> it's true. So did you. That's how it was, right? You could, you could, America still had a moral spine, still did. They still had what they called undesirable aliens. That's something many of you wouldn't even know what that means. That means that if someone was morally uh, charged with a crime in another country, they wouldn't even allow them to come in. When they went through passport control, they would be sent back. They were undesirables. Why? Because there was this real strong moral base here. I, I could go on and on. It's just true. That's how it was. It was very moral. I mean, you could watch TV. You could watch. These are still classics. You can still watch them if you wanted to. You know, uh, I Love Lucy. And, and there were jokes about that because Lucy became pregnant. And people say, how? Because Ricky and she didn't share the same bed. And they would laugh about that, you know. She became pregnant with little Ricky. And they'd say, how'd that happen? That's another miracle, you know, because <laughs> they didn't share the same bed. Those are things you didn't do, you didn't talk about. There were certain things that were right, and there were certain things that were wrong. And as a society, we agreed with them, as a society. So what you have today is so different than what it was even 50 years ago, 60 years ago. So different. For the young people today, it's all you know. For the older people, we've seen the corruption over time. But there were people who were thinking themselves Christians in the 50s because churches were full on Sundays. They would hear, but they did not do. They listened, but they didn't really believe. That's not new. Jesus is saying the same thing to these Jewish people during his day when he makes that point to them. You're not willing to come to me that you may have life. In verse 41, I do not receive honor from men, but I know, I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name. You don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive so in verse 41, I don't receive honor from men. The great majority of men, he said, are rejecting me. I'm not seeking the applause of men, but people are refusing to see me for who I am. He says in verse 42, I know you that you don't have the love of God in you. you you've read the Bible. It's like a rule book, but you don't see it as God's love letter. And because you have no love for God, you will have no love for his son. You, you don't know me, but I know you. And I'm aware of what you have in your hearts. I know what's in your hearts, but I also know what is not in your heart. Because you don't have God's love. Because if you did, you would love me. In John 8, 42, Jesus said, If God were your father, you'd love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. If you had the love of God in you, you'd love his son. In verse 43, he says, I have come in my father's name. You don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. You're not seeking the one sent from God. That means you're open to imposters. This is a, there are those who would point out that the Antichrist, who is yet in the future, obviously, will be received. He comes in his own name. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul said this. He said, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This one who's coming in the future, the Antichrist, presents himself, and they will receive him. You don't want to receive true Messiah, but in the future, people will receive the false one. 
He says in verse 44, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? You study, <laughs> indeed you do, but you study in order to become famous for your knowledge. But you don't study to become famous for your godliness. This is something that is really appropriate when we speak, when I speak and when I speak with and to my fellow pastors or Bible teachers. And I could go on a long time with you, and I won't. I'll just make a real quick comment. One of the dangers in ministry, one of the dangers that pastors wrestle with is the danger of fame, the danger of being well-known and well-respected. When a pastor begins his ministry, and say he begins a home Bible study, and there's three or four or five people, what's he going to brag about? Does he go, to around, go around to other friends and say, man, I had six people last night in my Bible study? No, because people say, really? I have more people in my carpool. <laughs> but what happens when you have, from that six, you have 60? And then what happens that you now have 600? And then what happens that you now have 6,000? When you had six, there was a humility there. There was an awareness. There was a on your face time before God saying, Lord, I just want to be used by you. But when you begin to see numbers show up, you can begin to be taken by the numbers. And guess what happens in churches just like this? You can begin to be an ear tickler because you start getting letters you start getting comments. I don't like the way you said that, Pastor. You shouldn't have said that, Pastor. How come you said that? And you start getting gun shy. Whereas before, everybody knew you. They know you're teasing. They know your humor. I had a lady approach me here uh, when we used to do Sunday mornings here. And I shared, and I do in a Sunday, and I teased my wife. You guys know I do that sometimes. Those of you who go to my church know that I will. I tease my girl. Why not? <laughs> and a lady stopped me outside. And she says, this is my first time here, and I want to tell you how I didn't appreciate the way you spoke of your wife. No, she said, I want to tell you I don't appreciate how you spoke of your wife. And I looked, and I said, this is your first time here, right? She said, yes. I said, I said, I understand. I said, if you were here longer than that, you would know that I would never, ever say anything about my wife that would make her look bad. But my church knows that I tease with her. Oh, see, people are that way. I, I, I just, I get letters and I get comments and it's just a fact. So you can begin to be that person who's afraid to speak because you're afraid people won't show up. And guess what? People vote with their feet. If they don't like what they heard, they leave. Sometimes they'll say something. Sometimes they'll say something from, from within the, the congregation. It wasn't that long ago that I was teaching and I was making a point and using an illustration and a gentleman yelled out at me, you're a liar, pastor. Yeah, and I told, I told Rawl, I thought you were <laughs> at your church today. No. <laughs> People will um, say the worst things, the most unthinking things, and you can get to the point where you, you want to just please them. So if I was speaking to a pastor right now, I'd be saying to the pastor, Speak in a way that pleases God. Don't worry about the way people feel. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. Speak it with gentleness. Speak it with encouragement. But speak the truth. Because in the day when people are searching for teachers to itch their ears, to say the things they're itching to hear, that's a sign of the last days. And every pastor needs to remain faithful. 
to what God has proclaimed to present the truth of the gospel regardless of whether people show up the next week because you don't stand before them in judgment to receive reward. You stand before him. So you make sure you honor him. And that's what I share with pastors, and that's what I share with myself. Some people want to become famous for their knowledge, but they don't want to be famous for their humility and godliness. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said it like this. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. For you, scholarship is more important than character. In Matthew 23, Jesus said in verses 6 and 7 that they love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, the greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. You receive honor for one another, but you're not seeking God's honor. And finally, he says in verse 45 to 47, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? To believe the writings of Moses is to believe the words of Jesus Christ. He's saying... In your rejection of God's witness of Scripture, you judge yourself. It's not only the specific words that Jesus spoke. It includes the words that Moses wrote. So Scripture condemns them because they reject the words that lead to faith in him. And God's word is perfect, and God reveals Jesus to man. So in the rejection of his word, you reject your own salvation. If you do not believe his writings... How will you believe my words? If you don't believe Moses, you will reject me.